Hi, this is Russell Glasser, host of The Atheist Experience. You know, The Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers and the generous support of viewers like you. If the promotion of positive atheist culture and separation of church and state are values that you hold, please consider contributing by becoming an ACA member or visiting our product page at EvolveFish.com under the Partner tab. Thank you. All right, welcome to the Atheist Experience. We are live. Uh, it is Sunday, December 6, 2015. I'm Matt Delaney, joining me this week, Martin Wagner. Hello. Uh, we're both taking a break from Fallout 4 and discussions of Fallout 4 to do the show. So. I'd be perfectly happy to do just a whole show talking about Fallout 4. Time, you know. See, and I, was, I thought you were going to say you'd be happy playing Fallout 4 and then taking calls. Yeah. I've we, done that on Twitch with Path of Exile. We could do that as well. It's, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. It's a bit distracting. The people who follow me on Twitch will tell you mm -hmm. that. Uh, as soon as there was a question that was something that required a little bit of thought, basically I ended up standing in town giving a lecture for 20 minutes and then going back out playing. <laughs> but yeah. we, we, are, we are live here. This show is sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin out of Austin, Texas. Uh, it is a live call-in show, and you'll see right down here, it'll say Skype, the Atheist Experience, no spaces, no, just all one word. You can send a message to that uh, that address. Don't call it, and our call screener will talk to you and get you set up. We've already got uh, four callers uh, queued up now, including a couple of theists, and there was some mm -hmm. discussion about whether or not we were going to be getting theist callers, but we've been doing good. Yeah, so that's that's, uh, that's good news. And I understand that our phone situation will be improving at some point. Yeah, so, actually, yeah. we had the ACA board meeting today, and there was a discussion about uh, a phone system that we're going to get, which is the same thing that they would use in a radio station. Uh, you know, like a call-in program. And so there'll be a box out here and a box in the other room. Uh, it'll take some time, probably late January is by the time we'll have all of the new audio stuff set up. Um, but there will be phone numbers again, um, and we won't lose our ability to take Skype calls if we ever need to. Yeah, well, that's, that's a good plan. Are you, are you sure you're... Am I? No, actually, that's why you didn't hear me very that well. Was, that was why it sounded like you were talking through my mic. <laughs> I was talking through, yeah. through Martin's mic. Now you are much more clear. Hi, we're and doing the show. Mm -hmm. It's live TV. Something's going to go wrong. It's the atheist uh, experience. Time. All right. Over so professional. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and uh, queue up Daniel. In Let us do that. Auburn Hills. And, uh, and it still sounds a little strange to me, Mike. There is some some echo. We'll work on it. I mean, yeah, it's the sound engineering thing is a is a constant uh, exploration that the guys keep working on. So, uh, whoops, I just adjusted your volume. Yeah. So, by the way, uh, in the by way of announcements, uh, after this show's over, uh, most of the people involved get together and go to dinner at Threadgills on Riverside. Uh, we're on till about five thirty. Maybe as late as six. I don't know how flexible you are today. If we want to, yeah, run I could do yeah between five thirty six. Be all right. We're no you know, longer. We're, we have in. that flexibility here, which is nice. I would like to get back to us doing you know ninety minute shows uh, regularly, and mm -hmm. and hopefully pretty soon. Um, I will be here again uh, next week, the thirteenth of December. Uh, but I will be out on the 20th, the 27th, and January 3rd, and there will be no show on December 27th. Basically, uh, there's going to be enough people gone for various reasons, some of whom are celebrating Christmas or some other holiday. Uh, others, I think it's just probably a good idea that we give people some time off every now and then. Yeah. Uh, since we can do more shows and, and spend more time on it. Um, and, you know, just for Tom Flynn's knowledge, uh, yes, I will, in fact, be taking the day off to celebrate Christmas in an entirely secular fashion. Which is a, a <clears throat> thing we, you can do. Yeah, imagine that. There's no uh, set of atheist stone tablets You might not know that Sinai. to listen to some people talk about yeah. who is and isn't a true secular. Tell, yes, telling you that you're, <laughs> you're atheisming improperly. Oh, I fancy. heard some laughing, so I think the mic in the back studio is actually on. Oh, so that, yeah. that might be where the, where the exercise <laughs> Yeah, guys, make sure we're oh, not... Or it could be Daniel, who I asked to put on. Daniel, are you there? Uh, That's me. That's right. me. How are you doing? Thanks, thanks for waiting and laughing to let me know that, that we should pay attention to our caller. No, it's okay. I, I, you, you guys are really uh, entertaining, and I, and I appreciate it. Didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt with my laughter. No, it's, no, good. it's we're all right. <laughs> we're, ready to, we're ready to listen to what you've got. Okay. Um, 
Well, I, I guess I might be a bit un, unusual compared to some callers because uh, just of my faith, I'm a uh, universal pantheist, and there's not a lot of us, and uh, we kind of differ from a, a lot of other faiths, and um, we, we like to think that we are kind of more or less in line with like, you know, uh, with the scientific community and scientific reasoning. Of course, I, you know, if, if you guys don't mind, I'd have to give you like a real quick you know, just one or two minute like rundown of my faith a little bit, like just the core, maybe. If, sure, you know, I, I, you know if you can kind of if you can kind of give a brief overview of, of what yeah, you believe, yeah. then we can get into the why, which is the more important part. Yeah, like the TLDR version. Exactly, that's what I'll try to do right now. So, okay. um, so what we have in common, we we like we pantheists, we like to start, we always like to start and focus more on you know the commonalities and the things that we all uh, have in common together. And what we have in common with, I would think, most atheists is is really actually um, leaning, at least my congregation, on scientific theory, on scientific, on the scientific method, because uh, we we agree with you that it's the um, it would be the it's the most reliable and and pretty much the best way to comprehend the universe. But to us, it is also the uh, most reliable way to comprehend God. Because okay. Because uh, people I, I believe those two things are the same, kind of. So, Daniel, I apologize for interrupting now. I just want to let the control room know we lost our monitor out here. Uh, so oh, okay. feel free to continue. Yeah, please. Oh, that, yeah, sure. Um, so what we uh, believe essentially is that even though, and we do not assert this as absolute. We do not assert this as something that you have to follow and accept with us. We just, this is what we believe, and, um, but we think we have a, a decently strong basis to believe it, believe it or not, even though it may not be, you know, a scientific observable basis, we believe it's a fairly strong one. Well, and I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused because what you said was you believe that science is the best way to understand God because you think that God is synonymous with the universe. Yes, essentially. So if God and the universe are synonymous, how do you draw any distinction? Yeah, I mean... Well, that's basically our belief, at least at least my sect. I mean, there are different pantheists out there. I'm kind of, I guess, the most generic kind in that I simply believe that, believe it or not, as insane as this might sound to you guys, we are all a part of God, literally, in a, in a literal well, sense. Okay, God, what... The universe is one thing and that we are a part of it. Yeah, I think that to us it just sounds like you've come up with another word for universe. And you know, I, I understand the, that. Yeah. <laughs> the curiosity that I have would be... Well, here's it, where we deviate. I could tell you where we deviate pretty strongly, and we do not expect those mm -hmm. of a scientific mindset to follow us out here in, in this land. But where we would deviate, I would assume for most scientists, is that at least... You know, I can't speak for all. I speak for my my group and myself, which is that we believe that the the that God, the universe, is in fact, you know, a, a living thing. Believe it or not, that we are all in fact part of a great living being. Believe you, you, it or keep, not. you keep saying believe it or not, and and there's probably really <laughs> I expect, good reasons. I expect not. I expect not. There's, yeah. there's probably really good reasons for that because. Yeah, yeah. So if you and I agree on what the universe is. Yes. Uh, and well, I'm, 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 I guess we don't fully agree on what right it because is, but, you but we think, agree it's we, we we you know i see the same thing you right. do mm -hmm. but we might call it something a little different like well, the it's not the it's not like daniel hang on hang on that's okay all right we we could define all the characteristics of the universe and i'm assuming that we would largely agree yes but you're adding something to that while yes, also are. saying that it's synonymous and I would like to know what's the justification for adding something to that because the God label carries some baggage. And if you say oh, that no. God and the universe no. are synonymous, then you're simultaneously trying to add the baggage and deny the baggage. Yeah. Yes. Well, essentially that, that is the gist of what we do. But we see it pretty clearly that what we do is just... We go with science so far, but then we add this extra Why? Yeah, of ours. and that, that to me would be, if you're already working from a premise that you acknowledge the superiority of the scientific method as, uh, as a method for uh, evaluating truth claims reliably, why think that that needs to be improved upon if it's already getting it right? Oh, and, you know, and needs to have. I really think it needs to be improved upon. I, mm -hmm. I, I would say the scientific method is good the way it is, and the progress yeah. it makes is, is very good. But we simply, where where I guess we kind of do disagree with, I guess some scientists is that mm -hmm. we believe there is there's more that we can't 
observe and, and measure, but there is so more. Yeah, but I think that where science and you guys part ways at that point is, is scientists get to the point and say, well, we've sort of reached the bit of, you know, where our present level of knowledge stops. Oh, yeah. And, I, I uh, and we, you, we wouldn't want scientists to agree with us. That would mean you're doing a terrible job. Okay, then <laughs> why do you agree with yeah, you? Because, yeah, why do you okay. believe it? Because well, what, what I'm getting out of this is that you're, you respect science, but you still like the bit about religion, traditional religion, that allows the believer to kind of anthropomorphize the universe, uh, you well, know, projecting I'm, I'm really, yourself. If, if I could go into a bit of, if I could go into just a bit of detail, we do not claim to have any sort of knowledge. Uh, yeah, I know, I know you're not, you know, making. I know you're not okay. making absolute truth claims, but you it's, do have this belief that you're you're trying to, you know, get us to at least see why you. Yeah, I'm not. I, we under, I, under, I understand. You're not making a claim about absolute certainty. That's good because I don't think you can be absolutely certain about anything. Oh yeah, yeah. You're not making a claim to necessarily knowledge. I get that. You're making a claim that you believe something, and we keep asking for what is the justification for this belief. And so far, we've heard, well, we think there's more, which is just telling us again what you believe, not why. And you've also said that, well, when science reaches its limit, we keep going. And my thing is, here's a soft drink bottle, and. We could, somebody could call me and say that they're convinced that there's something more to this soft drink bottle, and even though science can't find it, they think that they're justified in believing that there's something more. And I want to know why, because... Okay. I, I, can, I can get into that with you, that's okay. If you, don't, if you don't mind, it might require a bit of, you know, detail orientation. I don't want to chew your ear off, but I can, I can get into what we see as, as the proof. Sure. Really, I, not, my biggest concern isn't so much what people believe, it's why they believe it, because that's the important part. If you believe something and you don't have good reasons, why would you, I, I, I don't understand how you could recognize that you don't have good reasons and hang on to it. So you seem to think that you have good reasons yes. for thinking that there's something more that would qualify the universe as God. A, a, a living organism of some sort. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. Well, I think I think I have good reasons. I can get into either one, either the either our what we take as proof or our reasons. Uh, which, which would you want first? I don't know. Whichever one's best. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'll, whichever I'll one is most succinct think, and on point. Sure. I, I'll start with the reason because I think I think it's it's more important. Um, the the reason is that uh, we truly do feel there is a deeper connection that we sometimes experience between. Not just between people; it can have it can even happen between like a, a person and an animal per se. Sometimes there's this deeper connection. I don't know what that means. Yeah, no. and and I, 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 well, how could could yeah. somebody say that they have a deeper connection with this soft drink? Well, it's uh, a, yes, that's true. That's yeah, true. The, the, the more to the point of what Matt is trying to uh, you know we're trying to pry out of you here. Okay, we get you keep sort of reiterating what we feel, what we believe, what we do. We're really just sort of interested in why. Okay, we get it. You, we, you feel there is a deeper connection. Why do you feel there is that deeper connection? Uh, that needs to go beyond science for the understanding. See, that's see, that's what we're getting at. We're the, getting the reasons, getting to the reasons for all of this, and you keep essentially just restating what it is, you know, what the belief is that you have, what the feeling is that you have, and we're still, you know, we're about the wherefores here. Exactly. Yeah, I'll, okay. I, I, I want to get to the wherefores too. I, I don't want to bore you guys. Yeah. Um, but so the 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 why and the where we believe this is is because we have found really that believing this has made us do more positive things and have made us. It's made me a better person. Really. Okay. You, okay. So, somebody could say that about any number of things, which tells you nothing at all about whether or not they're true, right? Yeah, ex exactly. No, we, we, so, we, so arguing for the utility for, for practical benefits, for example, believing that you, uh, you're going to make it through a situation could encourage you to do things that make it more likely that you're going to get through the situation, but that doesn't yeah. tell you anything about the base belief. Okay, well, so, so to, to, to apply that to us then, it's we truly do believe that even if, 
and and we do accept criticism, so we accept the possibility we could be wrong. But we believe I, that I'm not concerned about if, whether you're willing even to. Even if we are incorrect, that's a shifting of the burden of proof. No. To simply say, "Hey, we accept the possibility that we could be wrong," means that you're sitting around for somebody to demonstrate that you are wrong and that you're going to hold on to your belief until that happens. And what I'm asking you to do is justify why someone should believe this in the first place. The burden of proof is on the claim that there's something more. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I understand that. That's why we really, I mean, we really can't. I mean, we just have to accept that, that we okay. don't have all right. that. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, so, so, so you accept that you can't, and yet you yes. believe it anyway. Why do you think that this is rational or good? Could not that justification be used for anything, any belief? That is what we hear from traditional religionists. You know, that it's when we speak to... You know, a traditional Christian, even a, you know, whether they're liberal or fundamentalist or what have you, and the, ultimately they will get back to, well, you just have to take it on faith at a certain point in the arguing process. And at that point, kind of, the discussion's kind of done because you have to realize that you've, just, you've got different ontological ways of processing uh, you, you know, what goes into your head. And you know, there, at, at a certain point, there's no real conversation that you can have because you're just coming at it from, you know, there has to be a way to distinguish whether yeah. or not you're right okay. in order to justify believing something. Yeah. We get that you have a respect for the scientific method, but we also get that you have this set of beliefs that goes beyond that. And, uh, and I understand that you're, you know, even though you don't expect us to agree with you, you're trying to get us to at least understand where you're coming from and why it is you believe what you believe. But you haven't really actually given us that information. You just sort of keep reiterating, uh, you know, this is what we feel, this is what we believe, and, and now you've kind of gotten to the point where well, uh, you, you kind of have I'm to not. just buy it at a certain point. And, and it's, so it's just starting to sound like a bit more of a sexed up, you know, uh, pro-science version of what is traditionally religious, you know, belief. Oh yeah, no, no, it, it is religious belief, but see, I, where I think we really do differ a bit, I mean, at least from other faiths, is that we really do try to progress and understand things. I mean, for instance... How can you? Yeah, I'm... You can't even explain why you, why someone should believe this. There's, no dis, there's nothing about your belief that is distinctive. It, it is, in fact, anti-scientific. It is irrational. And yet, you, you, you know, oh, well, it encourages us to do good things. Okay, well, there's all kinds of ways to encourage people to do good things without having to necessarily believe that the universe is a god. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Of course. But the, and every, every time I, I try to get to a distinction that shows why you believe that this is true, you've got nothing more than, I just believe it's true. Well, it's, it's because, I mean, the, the only way I could explain it would probably be a bit unsatisfactory, which is just that when I was told about this belief at, and, and I didn't have belief before that, I was, I was a Christian for like the first third of my life, then I was mm -hmm. atheist. And and then I came across this belief, and it just it just clicked. I felt I okay. understood what they were saying. So if somebody came up to you with another belief that had just as vacuous a foundation as this one, would you then believe it? <laughs> no. Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. So then, aren't you admitting that you believe for no good reason? Well, the the way I look at it is this: is that um, I was kind of shopping, and the way. And the, and the way to... You were shopping for an explanation and an answer and something that felt significant. And rather than caring about whether or not it's true, you went with the one that felt right. No, I went with the one that, that connected with me in a okay. way I really... How the hell is that, that different that from is, felt right? That is, that's, a, that's a traditional reasoning of, of pretty much the follower of most religions. You know, I, I, I accept that. That's, that's yeah. true. The and, and, you know, and we're not trying to... the thing that brings me to this one. So but, do, do yeah. you care whether or not your beliefs are true? Um, okay, see, so you know, hesitate. Honestly, not. Honestly, not. Okay, I uh, do, and so we'll I, move on to talk to people who yeah, may care okay. whether or not... I mean, not, we appreciate the explanation, but that ultimately is, that's the separator. You get to the point where you're satisfied with a belief uh, because I, it gives I, you I the warm care. fuzzies, I'm or... Sure, I'm pretty sure I do care, but it's just something I don't, I haven't, like, really yeah. thought about. Much. I'm pretty sure that you, you, you think you care, but everything about what you said, about what you believe, demonstrates that you don't actually care. Because if you care, then you try to find out whether or not your beliefs are true, and you try to find good reasons to believe and good reasons to disbelieve claims. That's how you distill whether or not a belief's true. And in your case, 
you started off with, hey, we really like science, but where <laughs> science doesn't get us an answer, we're just going to take a leap on what feels good. Well, yeah. that is demonstrably irrational because yeah. you could justify any belief using that same method. Yeah, you know, and we get and, and we that. and we know no, that that's, that's true. religion kind of works in this world of emotional logic, and which is not always strictly intellectual logic. And you know, uh, it, if it's personal, if it if it provides a personal sense of emotional satisfaction, we understand that that is a, that is an appeal of religion generally. But I don't really. There's nothing that sets um, you know your universal pantheism apart. Um, from, I would say, Christianity or any of the other Abrahamic faiths or paganism or what have you, just because you know you you happen to wave the flag of hooray science more often I think than those guys. The biggest, the biggest, the biggest, this, the biggest that, difference is that they have a list this long of unsupported <laughs> positions that they accept, and your list is a little bit shorter. Well, I think our list is a, is a lot shorter, actually, okay. but I, we won't quibble. Yeah. Here's, here's the thing. is The that, point isn't how long the list is. The point is how well supported the list is. I, I agree. Our small list is just as unsupported. This is Okay. True. All right. But, well, the, but could I just mention this real quickly? Sure, sure man. That, you know, these, a lot of these other faiths, they'll come to you saying, you know, what, where is your proof? And they tend to point to, you know, a book or an ancient writing. But we will at least point to something that most people have told us they feel. You know, it's something that can be repeated. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a, we, we usually point to something actually kind of specific, but I don't want to, you know, I know you guys don't want all the minutia, but we really do think that there are very specific instances of things that happen in the world that, um, that point to something. And I, and I don't mean vagueness. I mean, say, for instance, what we look at, one thing we think is a bit of a proof is the amount of altruism that people show. We really do honestly think, we don't, I don't knock behavioral ecologists, but I really do think that Darwinian evolution does not quite account for 100%. So what? Yeah. So what? The fact that, the fact that a no, I know that, I know, hang I know on, that hang on, hang on, well. hang on. Okay. The fact that a particular model does not account for something I know. does not mean you have any justification to accept a model that does. Because the accounting for it is on no foundation at all. I mean, any, any number of untrue claims that you just want to mm -hmm. accept could justify altruism. But I'll also disagree with you as to whether or not we have a decent account for altruism. And it's the, one of, the, most, one of mm -hmm. the best answers is that it is, in fact, ultimately selfish, even when it appears that it's not. Because yeah, by I, I'm aware of that. I, I've actually I've looked at journal articles and things, and I actually mm -hmm. think mostly they're on the ball. But it still seems, and I've even talked to some ecologists who agree that there is a bit too much. There is it occurs with a frequency a bit high, and I and I realize scientifically the best a bit thing too much for the, what the, it, the both the frequency and intensity of altruism is a bit higher than what. Uh, evolution by natural selection. Really? Is. How did you reach that conclusion? What calculation can you do to determine how much altruism we should expect in a naturalistic universe? Well, well that's exactly it. I mean, I mean, you can't. This is a feeling. Okay, so fun. if you can't, then you don't get to say there's too much. You don't get to pretend like you can quantify the unquantifiable. Well, exactly. I, I understand this is something that can't be quantified, but I mean, this is just something well, you that did. me and yeah. a lot of other pantheists kind I mean, of agree on, that we really do feel like there's a, more than what science accounts for a bit. Okay, I but really I think don't that, care. Yeah, because uh, yeah, you're, you're back to doing the thing that traditional religionists do in exactly the same way. Christian creationists uh, will point to, whoa, well, these, there, these are the, this, that, and the other gaps in evolutionary theory, and because of those, there must be something more that science can't quite explain, and so we will got the gaps that into uh, into a solution. So, it's it, I, 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 you come back to I think just being the same kind of traditional religion that say, you claim to have risen above. So let me ask you one last question before we move on to John, who will get queued up in a second. Let's sure. say you were doing a call-in show to discuss what people believe and why. How many calls would you take from people who admitted, I believe this and I have no good reason why I believe it? Well, maybe a few. It, it, I would kind of do case by sure. case and kind of... And, and why, why would you take those calls? Um, it, it would depend if they thought they had something interesting to bring to the table or if they were just kind of, you, you know, um, okay. being I, aggressive. I'll tell you, I'll tell you why I, I'm willing to take those calls for a little while, and it has nothing to do with whether or not they bring anything interesting to the table, because by definition, they are not bringing anything interesting to the table. The point is to demonstrate to people, 
and educate people. That there's nothing interesting being, being brought here. There's nothing substantive. There's nothing demonstrable. And as people acknowledge, hey, I believe this and I don't have good reasons for it, but it really feels right. And if you can get people to recognize that this is what they're doing, then maybe you can get them to start caring about whether or not their beliefs are true and to stop believing things. To simply say, oh, there's more altruism than we would expect First of all, you have no way to calculate that to make that determination. But even if you did, even if we were somehow able to put altruism units on something and determine how many altruism units we're likely to see under methodological or under a naturalistic universe by purely uh, Darwinian means, that doesn't tell you what the explanation is for the extra altruism. And so you don't get to just say, oh, well, I think the explanation is this, and therefore it's rational. And it gets, it gets a position where people are acknowledging that they are being irrational while trying to proclaim that they are, in fact, being rational. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's just, I guess, when you're in a, when you're in a sort of faith for a while, you can start to see it. You're surrounded by those people, and you can start to see it as rational, I guess. I guess mm -hmm. so I really not have give to think up? about think about my uh, belief more. Okay. Well, we, we appreciate the call. Thank you. I'm, I'm thank, happy. Thank anybody. you for giving me a fair shake. I appreciate sure. it. Guys. A anybody who's willing to rethink things based on you know, new information or a different perspective, good for you. So we'll get uh, John queued up while we're... By the way, John's called the last couple weeks in a row. Ah, uh, all right. And the, the first week, uh, his proof for God was prophecy, but that, after a lengthy discussion, came down to... Uh, we'll know these things in the future, so I told him to call back in the future when right. we know these yeah. things. Uh, and last week, uh, he called in and, and acknowledged that it wasn't quite the future. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely one week in the future. Yeah, it was at least that it much wasn't in the future. far enough in the future It was for a sort of future, yeah. But evidently this week, John has something entirely different. And what would that be? That will demonstrate the truth of a God existing. Oh, okay. So, hey, John, how you doing? Yeah, very good, thanks. Hello, how are you two? Uh, hello, John. I had a tooth pulled, so I'm probably a little more irritable this week. <laughs> uh -oh. But not to worry. Not to worry. But Martin is here to keep me in check. Yeah. Am I? Oh, is that my... Yeah. I'll nice that. to meet you, Martin, as well. Likewise, John. Yeah, I'd like to talk about um, heaven, hell, and why God allows suffering, if that's all right with you, or we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Well, I... I so... Well, uh, you know. the, the first questions that, that leap to mind, um, this issue of why does God allow suffering presumes there's a God. And so I'm not necessarily sure that we should spend much time presuming something that hasn't been demonstrated. Uh, now, I'm happy for you to give arguments for why you believe certain things. But much like the last caller, if you're only calling in to tell me what you think about heaven or hell or why God allows suffering, your personal interpretations of these without some sort of fact-based, rational argument to, to, to support the idea that they're true, I don't know why we would waste time on that. But yeah, and because you know, the world has been full of cultures that didn't have this problem worrying about wringing their hands over why God allows suffering. The ancient Greeks, their gods you know, drank and partied and got in fights and screwed and did all kinds of stuff. So clearly those were gods that had, you know, that they certainly didn't expect their gods to prevent all pain and suffering. I mean, so it's, it's very possible to have a God concept where that doesn't even apply. So you can make whatever case you want, but fair yeah. warning, if your argument doesn't rise above the previous caller, mm -hmm. or if it's something that somebody could argue on behalf mm -hmm. of the existence of Krampus or why Krampus abducts Mm -hmm. uh, the, the terrible children at Christmas, then we're probably going to be done again. Yeah. Feel free. Because, you know, you have the, the Abrahamic God that everyone wants to be sort of your perfect big brother is always looking after you, and then this creates the problem of evil. Or you could have the Olympian gods that are just a bunch of, you know, awesome partying drunks. Uh, but in both cases, you know, if we're going to talk about them meaningfully as if these are real things that we should care about in our realities, then that's where we have to start with, you know. Either prove the Olympians, prove the Abrahamic God, or if not, make persuasive uh, presentations that why <coughs> believing in them is rational. We'll go from there. But beyond that, it's like, yes, yeah, so what? You know, God allows suffering. That's, that's you guys' problem to work out, not ours. Yeah, but um, I have heard um, Matthew talking to members of Christendom and uh, being uh, like in conversations about uh, these subjects. Yes. Um, yeah. So, uh, well, just briefly, uh, um, that 
uh, with heaven, if God uh, wanted humans to be in heaven, he could, have played, he could have made them in heaven in the first place. Cool. I, I've, I've asked that exact same question. So I, I've asked why, why wouldn't God do that, and your position is that he could have. Yeah, but I mean, uh, why have the human form and why have the planet Earth and the physical realm? I don't know. When yeah. God could have done that, if, uh, if that's what God wanted for humanity to be in heaven, he could have just made them there in the first place. So that's, and, and, that's according, and according to the lore, wasn't that the idea, right? I mean, the God had it all set up down here. And then, oh, Eve was tempted and you know, screwed up the big plan, uh, which presumably God should have seen coming, but, you know, being om omniscient and everything, but didn't. And so he had to kind of rejigger his plan a bit, which, uh, you know, makes sense the Old Testament really needed a story editor at that point, but... Uh um, God has the ability of foreknowledge, but he chooses not to use that ability on know? most occasions. How do you so know? As to yeah, I mean, it, it, this is this is this is fine, John. The, the problem is, it's like I don't know how how much you've read of our our um, our show blog. It goes back several years, so there's a big backlog. What you may have missed at some point a few years back was that Russell Glasser, who is the other host, yeah, as I'm sure you've talked to him, and I'm usually on with Russell. Russell came up with this whole thing that he calls the Star Trek rule. And it describes this curious situation that atheists find themselves in when we are approached by believers like yourself who want to have these kinds of conversations. It sounds like you know, you're, you're having a conversation with someone and then they all want to go into you know, Star Trek talking about Captain Kirk. Or it could be you know, whatever their favorite uh, you know, headcanon is about the Avengers or the Marvel Universe or or you know, whatever anime they're into. And, and they're talking about these things like they're real and they're meaningful and that they should be important aspects of our lives. You're like, well, wait, hang on. <laughs> start over here. Yeah, it, uh, it, you know, it's, 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 it sounds exactly like that. I mean, you can, you can start talking about and, and the powers that he has that he could exercise if he wanted to, but it chooses not to and this. And it all sounds to us like you're describing some vast manga and a big angels story. Angels dancing on the head of a pen. Yeah, and it's, it doesn't... It's, there, we need to have a, uh, a you know, we need to start from a, a, a basis of why would we think that this is anything other than that? That this is an actual real thing that we concern ourselves concern ourselves with. I, I'm for, fine with doing a reducto ad absurdum where you assume, for the sake of argument, that X is the case in order to show why it's in conflict. Yeah. You told us God can do this and God can do that, and He chooses to do this. And my question to you is, how do you know that that's the case? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, well, beliefs count for nothing. So just to uh, go back on Martin's point, um, I totally agree with that, all that he said. So beliefs count for nothing, and so we have to learn the truth, and the truth is not dependent on us knowing about it. Um, but uh, where, where it, if you're saying, what's the basis for proof for all that I'm saying? What is the basis for your beliefs, yes? Yeah. Yeah, okay, well, it goes back to uh, difficult proof and a, a little bit of difficult proof as well. Uh, did, so uh, is the, the fulfilled prophecy found in the Bible. That you, is. You can proof. disconnect John again. Uh, <laughs> I told you, John, you could call back when we were in the future to be able to confirm that. Uh, also, I'd recommend you go to my YouTube channel and watch the video on prophecy because you are grossly misinformed about prophecy. Um, when I ask you why you believe that God can do this and doesn't do this, even if you had a laundry list of confirmed predictions that came true, that in no way tells you why it in no way tells you anything about the mind of God because you can't even tie a God to the reason why those prophecies came true. And the worst part of all of this is that you don't actually have a laundry list of prophecies that have come true. What you've got are some claims that have been interpreted as prophecies and in the fulfillment, which is also a matter of interpretation. If, if I predict what the weather is going to be tomorrow, if I predict that eventually we're going to have a female president in the United States of America, I don't have to have any sort of supernatural 
powers to make those things come true. And even if you saw someone performing on stage as a mentalist and they were able to tell you the word that you're thinking of, that doesn't mean that they have psychic powers. And even if they did, that doesn't confirm how or why those powers work. It doesn't let you get anywhere near the claims that you're making. Instead, what you're doing is saying, much like the first caller, here are these things, and without any justification other than those things, I believe the best explanation for those is that there's a God. And I'm going to take it a step further and tell you what God's characteristics are, what he's capable of doing, and why he chooses not to. You are pulling shit right out of your ass. Which is yeah, usually where it comes from. And see, that's the, the problem with prophecy is that it, you, it, in, in we'll addition to the, yeah, the, this addition, this, uh, the situation of a establishing like a legitimate causal link. Oh, here's a thing that happened. And oh, here's exactly. something that was written ages ago that seems to describe this thing. Um, well, first off, how, to, to what degree are you sort of a, fitting all of this, you know, retrofitting all of this in order to make sure that, in order to guarantee that, yes, every single, these are, da these are valid data points that are being made that specific, it, it's always curious to me how, how no prophecy has ever existed that, you know, written in the, you know, third century, you know, on a, on a, <laughs> on a cave wall by a stick covered in dung where someone said, on X and X and date, on the, the year 2001 of a calendar that has yet to be created, uh, a horrible event will occur in a city that does not yet exist yeah. called Manhattan. Yeah, we, specificity would be awesome. Prophecies, right? in order to, to count for anything at all, yeah. need to be specific, answerable by a single instance, yeah. and not prone to interpretation. Yeah. And then here's the problem that I was trying to point out a minute ago. Even when you get that, the next question is, how is it that someone was able to accurately make this prediction? And the only answer until you demonstrate an explanation is, I don't know. And if you start by claiming that clearly they must have had supernatural powers, you are proclaiming that you are sufficiently omniscient or sufficiently knowledgeable that you have excluded all possible naturalistic explanations, including luck or reasonable intelligence yeah. or advanced computing or time travelers. How did you how did you discount the idea that Doctor Who came back and told him something? Yeah, I, I, oh, supernatural. That's a word that people throw out there yeah. as as a, as a catch-all sort of band-aid. When, when and, you know, when it's like it, it assumes that the supernatural is a thing that has a methodology that it can be comprehended, and we haven't even gotten there. So yeah. to say that something supernatural is the opposite of, a, of an explanation because it's just an empty word. Yeah. The, the, by the way, let's go ahead and get Thaddeus queued up. But uh, so the, the, for both of those first two callers, science has a limit. Mm -hmm. And that limit is not something that science said, oh, we're, here's where we're stopping. Yeah. It comes from a recognition that we currently don't have a mechanism to identify the existence of the supernatural or any way to determine causal yeah. connections between the yeah. supernatural and the natural. And, and not only, it's not only not just that, it, it's, it's not even science reaching a point and going, well, well, might as well throw our hands up. You know, this one's just going <laughs> to... We're, we're going to be baffled forever about no, this, this one, so we may as well just stop. It's a recognition so, that we can't make declarations about those things. Mm -hmm. And when theistic callers try to come in and say, I know that science can't tell you anything about the supernatural, but I can. No, you're full of it. Mm -hmm. You need to demonstrate, and by the way, if, as soon as you can demonstrate a mechanism by which you are able to know what is generally considered currently unknowable, as soon as you demonstrate that, man, you win the Nobel Prize, the Templeton Prize, you overturn everything in the world because you've added a whole new area of study. Um, I, mm -hmm. I, I just don't see. Do we get a, the next, just whatever caller you want, just cue them up. Yeah. But you, this, Christians are claiming to run around being little God detectors. They're claiming to be able to detect mm -hmm. what they, most of them, would think is acknowledged as undetectable. Mm -hmm. And they don't recognize that conflict, just like the first caller is claiming, you know, he, he, has a, he thinks he has a justified belief in something that he acknowledges isn't justified. Right. This is why, you know, like our, our very first caller, at least he was willing to get to the point where he's just like, yeah, you know, I, can't, I know I can't justify. Because you know, we hear these arguments, right? We hear these proofs and this logical stuff. And, but to be perfectly honest, is there a single sitting in a pew at church believer in this country anywhere 
who was converted to the belief system by that kind of argument? I don't think it is. I no. don't think that atheists. These are post hoc explanations. Yeah. yeah. Atheists approach the critique of religion as a set of ideas. You know, it's an intellectual exercise for us. And I think that religious belief lives in this world of emotion and feelings and what gives me pleasure and comfort. And that's the, that's the real reason why people embrace these things. They're raised into it and they, the, and, and these. It sounds like we have Darth Vader on hold. At this yeah, point. what is, what is going on? Is it, we just is had it like Josh a truck drive Jones? by or what? Yeah, it's me. Hey, Josh. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. Uh, how are you guys today? Uh, we're doing okay, I suppose. What's on uh, your mind? Cool. Uh, I'm from St. John's, uh, Newfoundland. It's uh, you probably never ever heard of it before. Well, I've, I've, yeah, I've heard of it. Not been anywhere near it, but I know of it. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, the, the question that I have is is recurring to uh, psychics. I have a friend who's a psych psychic. You have a friend who's a psychic. Well, suppose psychic. I don't believe her. I think she's full of shit. But mm -hmm. okay, you know, she uses her so-called psychic powers and gets money from it. And uh, I don't agree with it at all. I think it's wrong. But any time I bring up the subject to her, she's very vitriolic and she's very nasty and mm. and mean and and she's not very understanding when it comes to trying to like approach, approach her about about what she is and I'll say you know, like they're frauds but she has a problem with that. That sounds yeah. I'm what what does she claim to be able to do? Well she she claims to be able to read people's mind and to have e, uh, ESP. Okay, and ask ask her what number I'm thinking of. Uh, she probably won't be able to guess it. Uh, yeah, guess is the operative word probably. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yes. so if she thinks she can read minds, um, certainly you would think that there'd be a way to test that. I mean, what are, what I, you'd need to find out a, a clear, accurate description of what it is that she can do and how she. Well, well, she needs to define I can do this, and then you can agree on a way to test it. I know, and the thing is, um, I don't know if I, I kind of don't want to be friends with her anymore because I don't yeah. respect the fact that she takes money from people doing this, and and it wounds me in my deepest intellectual integrity because, like, why would I be friends with somebody who's taken money from people and taken advantage of people? Well, who's I think so you've got, I think you've got the wise approach there. That, I, that was that was gonna be my first question to you. It's like, why are you friends with this person? I mean, maybe you go back so you have a history or something like that. But it, the the fact that when you just tried to press her on these basic points that we've just discussed, you said her response was vitriolic and oh, angry. Oh, she was so mean. Yeah, then uh, no one treats a friend like that. I mean, if you've got like a serious concern and, you know, it sounds to me like this is someone who is, and this is my disgust with those kinds of people in general. They play the role, like Sylvia Brown when she was alive and all of these TV people who, I can talk to your dead uncle for $900. They pretend to this great empathy and compassion, but they don't have really any of it. They're vultures, they're completely selfish, and they really just are about their, it, it's about their egos. It's about they need some reason to believe that they are above everyone else and connected th to this wonderful universal truth that the rest of us peons are not. And that is really what is vile to them. And so, yeah, I was going to just say, if, if you think you need to just part ways with this person, that would be my advice. Just wash your hands over. She's some nasty work. And I completely disagree. <laughs> That's why this show is so fucking awesome. I can't read minds, so I can't uh -huh. tell you whether or not they have empathy, whether or not they're sincere. Um, my reason for cutting ties with someone isn't because I'm convinced that they are ripping off people, because until I know whether or not they can do what they say they can do, I can't demonstrate that they are defrauding people. But what I can say is that there's no good reason so far to believe that they can. And if they are reluctant and unwilling to be tested, and if they are reactionary at the thought of saying, hey, maybe we should test this, then I would no longer be friends with them, not because I'm convinced that they're a fraud who's, who's all about ego and ripping people off, because the real truth is they may be deceived also. There are any number of people who have been psychics for many, many years, and some of them started as knowing frauds, but 
then became. Can we mute J Josh for a second? I feel like I'm talking to Darth Vader. Yeah, he, we've got a lot There's, of echo in his. So they may be knowing frauds, who then get so many hits and fall uh, fall prey to certain biases that they end up thinking, hey, there's something to this. Go read the, the story of, um, oh, I'm not going to remember his name. Uh, it, it's not. Oh, uh, it's Marjo. Not, the... No, 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 no. no. It's, it's not Joe Nickel, but it's uh, uh, Ray Hyman. Um, oh, okay. But you yeah. can become convinced of this. There are others who became convinced through coincidences with no intent ever to defraud anybody that they had these abilities. There are reasons that people applied for the JREF Million Dollar Prize, which mm -hmm. is currently non-existent or being reformed. It doesn't matter right now. Uh, they sincerely believed that they could do these things, and they were willing to set up on a stage in front of hundreds of people and be tested. And when the tests fail, which they have done every single time, they, I don't know too many of them that changed their mind and said, well, I guess I was wrong. I, they yeah. come up with reasons and excuses uh, for why it ended up failing. So it may not be that the person you're engaging with is intentionally terrible. And their negative, their strong negative reaction to your questioning them may be more about their own doubts and fears that, you know, hey, maybe I don't quite have this right. So I would cut ties with them if they're unwilling to actually be tested because that, now they're the kind of person who clearly doesn't care about whether or not they can do what they, mm. they think they can do. Yeah, there's a distinction to be made between. But on that point, yeah. we, we would agree. Yeah. She, I actually wanted to test her, but she wouldn't have any of it. Okay. Um, yeah. There, there you go. Because I wanted, I wanted to do the Peter Vinkman thing, you know, at the beginning of the Ghostbusters movie where he takes out the cards and he, he she has to guess what card, like the wavy lines or the, the triangle and stuff. Right. And I wanted to, like, post, like, take them off, like, print them off and see if she could match up the cards to the thing. See how many correct ones and incorrect ones she got. She didn't even want to do that? Nope. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so you kind of know where she is. Yeah, there's no, you know, there, yeah. there are people who, you know, you can't force somebody to have a conversation. You can't force somebody to uh, embrace rationality or care about what's true. All you can do is try to encourage it. And if they're not the sort of person who's willing to do it, uh, then I don't have any interest in, in really associating with them. Yeah. Me either. That's the reason why I decided I, I'm thinking about deciding not having anything to do with her because, mm. like, what she's doing is wrong. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thanks for the call, Josh. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for sharing thanks. all that. We'll go ahead and get uh, Mike queued up while we sort that out. Okay. And so when I say, oh, I completely disagree, actually, it's not entirely <laughs> true. It's You had a good point. I mean, there are people, that, but, but there, there's a distinction to be made between people who are themselves self-deluded. And even as, as much of a vulture as she was, it is entirely likely that I think Sylvia Brown fell into a great deal of that. I understand her youth. You know, as a little child, she was very, you know, fantasy-oriented and had these imaginary friends. And I guess as she grew up, never got rid of them. You know, yeah, didn't can't outgrow the thing. So, you know, and... Uh, I can't say whether she was sincere. All we can say is that she was wrong a yeah. lot. And yeah. uh, so one of the things is that, <clears throat> and I, I will not do the entire lecture here, but I've talked before about skepticism, and I'm an atheist because I'm a skeptic. And the important thing about scientific skepticism, the modern skeptic movement, is that it's not about debunking. Mm -hmm. It is about attempting to confirm and then either confirming something or failing to confirm. And it has a roadblock that is the same as the roadblock of science that even if we could, even if we tested a whole bunch of dowsers and there was one person who kept getting it right, which has never happened, they all fail when tested properly. They fail over and over and over again. But if there was somebody who could consistently produce the phenomenon that they claimed, we would then be in a position of saying, ah, we have strong reason to think that this individual can do what they claim they do because they've got a track record of actually doing it, but we still don't know why. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where the investigation needs, has to end until we come up with something further. Mm -hmm. But atheists and atheist groups aren't always skeptical enough to suit me, uh, which I think is an issue of credibility that we need to work on. Skeptic groups aren't always atheistic enough to suit me, and that's a matter of personal preference. You can have your UFO or Bigfoot-only club. You can do the ghost hunter thing and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I just happen to think that the claims of the religious are the biggest elephant in the room for skepticism to address. Because mm -hmm. they impact the world the most. Right, and when people say, well, you know, they're not necessarily making testable claims, I would argue that a lot of the claims, um, the top-level claims, aren't testable. Dowsing as a top level claim is not testable. You need an individual to specifically say, I can do this in this way. You can't 
disprove the idea that it's possible. Uh, all you can mm -hmm. do is keep testing and either confirming or failing to confirm. And I don't see a difference. They're happy to test psychics for veracity, and I don't see a difference between Sylvia Brown or somebody saying, oh, I'm getting messages from the other side, and a preacher suggesting that he's getting messages or she's getting messages from the other side. Let's be honest, it's mostly dudes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not yeah. a lot of, of women preachers. But if how is it different? Both people are claiming to get messages from the other side that they're giving to people uh, in ways that help steer the decisions in their life. Uh, to me, the big difference is that there are oodles and oodles and gobs of preachers out there doing this, and not nearly as many psychics with not nearly as big a following and nowhere near the impact. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Mike in uh, Bournemouth, thanks for waiting. Hi, uh, Matt and Martin. Yeah. Nice to Am I coming through all right? Yeah, yes, you sound, uh, yeah, you sound a lot clearer. All the colors have sounded clearer than we do <laughs> today, frankly. You've got a lot uh, of really echo today. But anyway, thank you, yes. Okay, um, so my question is whether the holding of irrational beliefs or expectations can ever be justified. And basically, if so, whether a belief in a god can ever be justified. So my argument, if I can call it that, is essentially that there are many things that um, come as a result of an irrational belief, that, and not all of them are entirely undesirable. So, right. for example... Uh, love is often an irrational state to be in when most relationships end in failure. Um, a person starting a business often, le uh, often has an irrational like uh, vision of its future when most businesses are doomed to failure. Um, I don't know. Uh, essentially, it comes down to two things. In the, in the grand scheme of things, um, our lives can often seem pointless and uh, and experiences can often be so arduous that it might justify believing in a god just to get to the next day uh, which will hopefully be better mm. or the the second thing which is the lack of a belief in a god um, uh, could take away something uh, from life so uh, i don't know an example that i that i thought about was was uh, i remember my uh, first relationship I was uh, uh, I, I sat down uh, uh, with my girlfriend at that point and said, "Look, let's be realistic here. This is our, both our first relationships. Uh, statistically speaking, the chances <laughs> are we're going to break up." Necessarily, romantic date talk there, but that's okay. It reminds me very much of Tim mentions. If I didn't have you, yeah, <laughs> I'd very likely have somebody else. Uh -huh. uh, so here's um, the thing. Um, yeah. I think there's a way to frame this um, where you, you're basically saying that, oh, well, these are clearly not founded rational beliefs, and yet they may have positive results. Uh, I have no problem with measured rational optimism, okay? Because the big thing here is that uh, statistically you start a new business and most of them are going to fail, but you have no good way of telling whether or not yours is going to be the business that is or isn't. Uh, and we do know that if you begin by thinking that it's going to fail, that this affects how you act, and yeah. you, you may in fact increase Motivation. your chances of it failing. And if you are convinced that it's going to succeed, um, that may in fact be irrational based on the statistics. But you might be basing that on other things. For example, I don't care what the statistics are for businesses across the board. I care about the statistics that are relevant to the business that I'm entering and how well it's going to do. Um, I think that my state of mind going into the business is relevant to how likely it is to succeed or not. So I don't necessarily think that it's irrational to that we're that we're actually talking about irrational things. I think what the examples that you're giving it are we're making a decision in the face of the unknown, and we can either pay attention to statistics which may or may not accurately model what we're talking about. Um, or we can look at all of the information we have and say, you know what, this is worth the risk, and I'm going to work towards it actually succeeding and with the knowledge that I may in fact be wrong. It's much like you know, science, all positions are tentative and probabilistic, uh, but that doesn't mean that you know, in the absence of perfect knowledge that you're somehow being irrational. Mm. And, and, and it's also the case, and, and this may be a, an, an aspect of just the human experience that Maybe a lot of atheists, you know, don't give us, you know, take as seriously as we ought to, or at least I mean, aren't, aren't as 
willing to concede, uh, which is people are messy, right? I mean, the fact we have the capacity to be rational you know, thinkers, it doesn't mean we're going to be at all times or even at most times. People do things, you know, because it feels right. People do things because, you know, maybe just the, for a little shot of happiness that might outweigh the risk of otherwise. You, and you can look at it in so many aspects of life. You can say, why, why do folks stay in a relationship that's clearly not the healthiest thing they could be in? Because I love her. Leave yeah. me alone. <laughs> You know, why do people, you know, why do people do X and Y and we need, you know, why do people smoke and drink when they know it's unhealthy for them? Why do, why, so, so much stuff. And, and so we're not all, you know, these perfectly rational Vulcans, you know, logicking our way through life. And, and that's fine, you know. And, and, and to the extent to that that can apply to religion, um, I think it's like P.Z. Myers once said, you know, if religion was just like this private hobby like knitting, that you know the individual believer got pleasure out of. Who cares? You know, it's like I don't. You know, do you really? I mean, do you really believe that you have an angel sitting on your shoulder, and you know, and you know, whispering homilies to you, and 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 are you a lonely person in your life, and that is a thing that sort of makes you make some of that go away? Hey, you do you. You know, go. For, you know, that's that's not. You know, that's that's an aspect of it, and it, you know, it's it it comes down to a certain point. At what, at what point do genuine negative things that start impacting the human race at large, you know, that's, that's, where, that's where it all gets bad. That's where irrationality takes hold. That's when you, you um, that's when damaging results, you know, can, that's when you have the psychics who strip people's life savings um, because, you know, this person is ripe for exploitation because they miss their father or husband so much and all that kind of thing. So just, it's it, very easily mistreated. You know, I just don't them. think that it's fair to no. to label them as necessarily irrational yeah. um, just because there's a possibility they could be wrong. Like if you're, you're in an NBA game and you're the guy who gets pulled out of the stands mm -hmm. uh, to do the free throw or from half court for a million bucks, um, you can stand there and you know, hype yourself up and everything else, and that may or may not increase your chances. But I don't think that there's anything irrational about saying, hey, I'm going to throw this basketball in the general direction, and it's not impossible that it might go in. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to, like, go take out a loan based on whether or not I'm going to make the basket. Mm -hmm. But you, you, can, you can go for it. And when you're talking about things like relationships and businesses, I put those in that category. I don't think it's irrational yeah. to be optimistic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It slightly didn't address the, the the second part, which is which is there may be things that um, not believing in a god uh, does uh, take away from you uh, and take away the 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 enjoyment of. So uh, I, I, I've had an ongoing bet for years. Um, if anybody can provide a real tangible benefit that can only be achieved mm -hmm. by the truth of a religion and not through secular means, I, yeah. I was I was about to actually give give that as, as an example and, and one of the things that I was uh, that, that I thought that for example Christopher Hitchens uh, perhaps never dealt with when, when he uh, kept posing the question name a moral act that a religious mm -hmm. person can do yes. that an unreligious person can't um, which would be a an element of complete self-sacrifice a, a, a martyring of oneself for a the the probability or the possibility of doing something good that may be so small that it may be I mean unlike the case of uh, a relationship or a business where at least there's some chance. How did you that, determine that somebody couldn't do that? Yeah, because because I can think of an example right now where that the, to to refute that. But there there are there right. are atheists in foxholes, for example. Yeah. There are plenty of uh, non-believers in military situations where they mm -hmm. put their life at, at risk. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I, I don't necessarily know that we would call them martyrs, as that term might yeah. necessarily be religious, but Hitchens thing was, was specifically about a moral act, but I'm talking about any actual positive benefit that's tied to the truth of the religion. Yeah, I mean, like, if you wanted to sort of, uh, like, take the Hunger Games scenario where it's like, oh, take me, not my baby sister, right? I mean, I can, yeah. I can see a secular person, you know, being that protective of a sibling that they would do that and it's just you know that that wouldn't necessarily t take a theism to to motivate you um, i do think that the particular crisis you're talking about is you know a common uh, thing that affects 
atheists who have deconverted from theism, and so uh, that that particular aspect of the theistic experience, this notion of being watched over and looked after by a um, you know protective parent figure, as it were, that's now been taken away, and there's a there's a hole there, and and so that can be a really difficult part of transitioning into secular life for a formerly very religious person. So so that is a thing. I mean that is and. People, I think, have to come to terms with it in different ways, and it takes a whole lot of time. Um, I just had a, a buddy on Facebook um, ask this very question about this very situation. It's like, all right, I, he, you know, he considers himself this sort of middle of the road agnostic, not committed one way or the other. But he says, but I'm surrounded by the outspoken atheists in my life, all my friends, and, and so his question was, well, how do you deal? And he got to the nub of, you know, this this was the separator for him. It's like, how do you deal with the sense of futility? And so I'm like, all right, interesting. You know, you're starting with the premise that without whatever this is, this uh, assurance that theism provides, there will be a sense of futility. And I and quite a few other atheists responded to that by saying, what I, I deal with it by not really having one, right? Um, I, you know, I, I understand that there will come a day when I will not exist, and there will be years hence when the world will be consumed by the sun and, and vanish in a puff of ash, and then the universe will go to heat death, and then nothing was ever had a point. But you know what? I can't do anything about that. What I can do about is I'm here now, maybe I've got a few decades uh, of healthy life left. Got to make the best of them. Try to leave. But the the yeah. sense the sense of futility it illustrates a point that I've made before, which is that the problems and the be positive benefits mm -hmm. that religions uh, get credit for primarily come from solving the problems that they invented in the first place by mm -hmm. convincing people, oh, life is futile without God. They, they're yes. convincing you, here's the thing that's wrong, and we're the only ones with the solution. When in fact, the thing that they're saying is wrong probably isn't. Yeah. Uh, if we taught people how to, the facts about death and dealing with death and dying, um, the grieving process might change dramatically. And if people wouldn't be like, oh my gosh, how can you live not knowing that you're, you're not believing that you're going to spend eternity in heaven? Because uh, I don't have any good reason to think that it's true. I and mean, if I begin yeah. living my life as if that's not likely to happen or I have no reason to think it's going to happen, all of a sudden I live my life better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this notion that the, these are all things that are introduced into your way of thinking and told that you know you cannot have a sense of fulfillment without them. But it's like, and what religion does is it it, it insists that you have to, if yeah. you don't want to have a futile existence, be able to have a kind of impact on things that you cannot possibly have an impact on, like your own inevitable death, like the heat death of the universe, right? We can't do anything about the heat death of the universe. But, uh, you know, but if you are convinced, it's like, oh, I can't do anything about the heat death of the universe. It's all going to end in nothingness anyway. Life is futile. I think if someone's jerked your chain pretty badly and they've given you some unrealistic expectations of how high you should set the bar for your own sense of purpose, it's absurd. Uh, on that note, Mike, I appreciate the call. Yeah. Uh, we're going to try to get one more in before yeah. we're done. But thanks if for bringing can... it up. I mean, that was, that was, those are real issues, and thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, if we can go ahead and queue up uh, Mason, because we have an atheist who supposedly seriously has an argument for the existence of God. Interesting. Okay. There's that old adage, you know, that religion poisons you and then offers you the cure. Mm. And uh, I, I did a different version of that because I think religions convince you that you're poisoned when you're not and then offer you the homeopathic cure. <laughs> <laughs> because there's no there there. Ah. Uh. We... Hello? Do we have... Uh, oh, is Mason there? Mason? Is, it, is Mason you on? Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm cutting in and out, but that's okay. Try Go ahead. Yeah, we've got a little weird audio thing coming from that. And a monitor that's gone out for most of the show. Yeah. So you, you're an atheist and you have a, an argument for the existence of God? Yep. And you find it compelling? Yeah. Well, so why are you still an atheist? Yeah. Because um. <laughs> it's not that compelling, right? Yeah, it's not that compelling. Maybe better than most that you've heard. With okay. That, with, yeah. okay, go for it. Better than yeah. all that I've heard. Okay. Well, not all, because I did hear this one. Okay. Well, lay it on us. It's basically the computer simulation argument. Y'all heard of this? Well, I, I've heard proposals that we're living in a computer simulation, but go ahead with Nick Bos Nick Bostrom yeah. argues that there's basically three possibilities. One, uh, no, no society 
throughout the entire universe ever achieves its full techno technological potential, or once if a society does, there are two possibilities. One, they either choose to make a simulation or they choose to not make a simulation. And I actually can't hear you. Are you no, we're, we're, we're not listening? talking. We're listening. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think it's compelling because because it's wrong right so from the beginning. Big, so and there are so many planets it's, and galaxies. It's wrong right from the beginning. Okay. So there's two possibilities: either no civilization lives up to its full technological potential, or it does. I agree that those are the only two possibilities. How did we rule out the first one? We didn't. Okay. Then why would, why would we say, if we haven't ruled out the first possibility, that the second one, is, which is the one that leads to the idea that a god exists, or the computer simulation I exists? I think the second one is more likely. How did you determine which one's more likely? Well, I was going to say that the universe is so large. And yeah, but, but this is one universe. You, so you can't talk about how big the universe is and different civil, civilizations within the universe um, because those would all be within the simulation if this is a simulation, right? Um, yes, but you asked why if I thought a, a society could reach full technological potential. Well, you, you do, we haven't even defined what full technological potential is. Because, yeah, because I don't first know of all, it, what, it might not even be able to... Yeah, that Full, would full be, technological potential even if reached, does not mean capable of generating simulations. Yeah, I, agree, I agree. Okay, yeah, so yeah. Why, why is this remotely compelling to anybody? Because we haven't been able to rule out the possibility that nobody reached their full potential or that nobody's reached it yet and that, that we're living in the first universe and maybe someday it's, in the future. It's mm -hmm. really an argument just to show one of three possibilities are true. Okay. And... And, and then how like do we decide is, uh, which, between the three of them, how do we determine which one is most likely? Well, I think you can basically throw one out. And that's the one that says we might have some kind of moral obligation to creating to some Moral obligation to create a simulation or not do so? I don't know how you can throw that out. Yeah, I don't, I don't think yeah. anyone really had any yeah. kind of moral obligation. And I mean, and wouldn't uh, moral wouldn't, obligations get violated all the time? I mean, yeah. that, I can't see how you can throw that out for that. Yeah. And and wouldn't uh, you know? Isn't it just the very concept of full technological potential contextual anyway? Right? I mean, if you have a civilization at a let's say you have a species, humanity, at a certain point in its historical development, well, full technological potential for you know, the ancient Sumerians is quite a bit different from full technological potential of a, you know, 20th century superpower. And what's uh, worse than all that is that even if you found out yeah. and, and were able to calculate and determine no, I think that it's, hang on, yeah. hang on. Yeah, you're trying, let, him, let him finish, please. Even if you were able to determine what you acknowledge you can't determine, which is that it's most likely that we're living in a simulation, that doesn't prove God. All that does is prove that somebody made a simulation that we're living in. That doesn't. Yeah. That's not a god. It may not necessarily prove God, but I think it would be evidence for maybe an intelligent designer. Okay, except like that, that except that all of the evidence about the universe, except that all of the evidence about the universe we inhabit, does not lead to the conclusion of an intelligent designer. It, it is consistent with the universe. Mm, well, I mean, there's also other evidence like. Just the but I, existence of quantum mechanics. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Oh boy, that's a big right. ball of wax. We Thanks, do. Mason. Yeah, what? it's um. And at the end of the day, I don't think these little thought experiments really amount to much, right? I mean, the kind of God that a, a, something like this would want to lead you to sort of thinking about, this is not a, a God that any, anyone worships, goes to church for, prays to. I mean, the purpose of religion, I think, again, we're getting back to you know, why the, did, why the last people... color is identical to the first. Yeah. They have this fatuation with the God idea. Uh -huh. And so they're looking for some way to make the God idea fit the observable universe. And some people will do it with pantheism by saying, oh, well, it feels like there's so much more. Mm -hmm. So we'll just say the universe and God are the same. And some people will do it by appealing to Jesus or Yahweh or Jehovah mm -hmm. or Allah or whatever. And now this one's appealing to a computer simulation. If we keep going like this, I tell you, there's, you know, because there's this argument about the probability of 
all things uh, in the in you know if we expand this out in a multiverse that everything that ever happened could happen mm -hmm. which means that there's right. definitely we're living in a situation mm -hmm. simulation um, one of the things that's particularly frustrating about that is that it also allows you to conclude that there are uh, supernatural beings in the other universes that could uh, eliminate all of the other universes mm -hmm. this is the problem with taking an interesting idea and trying to find uh, uh, or accepting that it's telling you something real yeah. about something you can't investigate. Yeah, I think, yeah. People, oh, you're arguing for scientism, that there's nothing in the world except what's natural. No, mm -mm. I'm not arguing that the natural is all that exists. I am arguing that the natural exists, and anybody who asserts that something other than the natural or in addition to the natural exists has a burden of proof that they have not met, and that there is no demonstration they can possibly meet yeah. that burden of proof. Yeah, and, and, and otherwise you're just you're reading too much Philip K. Dick. That's all I can say. <laughs> anyway, that's it for this week's yeah. show. Appreciate it, everybody. Thanks to the studio audience out there. Thank you, everyone. Uh, here and oh, you can't hear them clapping, but they are yeah. clapping. I can. Uh, the, we're now at a part where like the ambient lights, like we can't see you, but we know you're in the other I've room. I've got a really good glass, reflection guys. of me yeah. and Martin in the fish tank. But uh, <laughs> we'll be back next week again. Look forward to seeing you then. Yeah, it's good to be back on the show with you. We